the two principal socio-political forces that were to shape the 19th century in Europe happened to be the Industrial Revolution and the rise of nation states. On many occasions, these two forces worked in tandem, creating an integrated market that the Industrial Revolution required, and this market was to be given its complete shape by means of erecting a nation state. And as it happened in the 19th century of Europe, the emergence of this integrated market revolving around a nation state meant fragmentation of existing multinational empires. By the 1870s, with the fragmentation of the, Habs the Habsburg Empire, as also the reintegration of the German lands by the rise of Italy on the south and the Kingdom of Germany, the Empire of Germany on the north, the twin forces of nationalism and industrialism had shaped the map of Europe that had come to be, that has since then come into being. By the 1870s, however, a contrary pull also began, a contrary push also began to be uh, manifested. As industrial society emerged all across Europe and the demands generated by industrial economy began to move into the forefront of um, the economic order that was then in being, the European states began to transcend the borders of their nation states that, had, that were coming into being and moved across the seas into other continents trying to develop colonial empires. This phenomenon of European nation states transgressing the borders of their own nations and developing colonial empires much in the light, uh, much in the manner of old multinational empires has occasioned historians interest and historians have come to speak of this world, this era as the age of empires. This phenomenon of the age of empire, which spans between the 1870s and uh, to right up to the uh, outbreak of the First World War in 1914, these four decades and a bit more, happen to uh, be matters of grave concern uh, at, a, at the time when it was unfolding, as also among historians since then, because it is suggested that it was the manner in which the age of empire unfolded that ultimately led to the Great War. As a result, both contemporary observers and historians of later generations have repeatedly gone back and tried to understand how this idea of an empire um, began to transmutate from the old system of multinational empires to one resting primarily on colonial exploitation. The earliest among the theoretical explanations about this empire, let's say the earliest among the theoretical engagements with this notion, came from the contemporary British economist J. A. Hobson. Hobson's argument was that industrial economy generated quite a lot of surplus capital by the second half of the 19th century. And as more industrial economies began to sort of compete with the original uh, industrial society, that is Great Britain, the capital that was generated, the surplus of capital that was generated, needed to be invested in, um, in wherever there was room for that. And the problem was that with the simultaneous rise of nation states, capital tended to be restricted within the uh, confines devised by the nation state, that is to say, Every capital needed its own hinterland to play from which it could exclude capital imports or, imp or other countries from exporting capital into that nation state. This need to export capital, the surplus capital by Europe to other parts of um, the world, ev eventually, Hobson would argue, was to sort of set in motion the dynamics that led to imperialism. This theory was modified somewhat later by Lenin in his work known as Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Lenin argued 
that the exploitative character of capitalism required alienation or let's say it made alienation a systemic feature as Karl Marx had originally suggested. Lenin's argument however was that as capitalism flourished, as more and more surplus profit was being generated, it was possible for the capitalist economies of Europe to distribute the benefits to the working classes and the exploitation on which the, the principles of capitalism were to rest were gradually, gradually beginning to reduce somewhat. And Lenin's argument was that this in turn compromised the principle of profit on which capitalism rested. And this required, Lenin argued, export of capital from the metropolitan regions, meaning from the home, from the mother country, into the colonies where workers were still capable of being exploited. So the surplus capital that was generated by the metropolitan countries, once a, a basic minimum living standard had been accorded to the working class, could not be made fully uh, exploitative or the relation could no longer be fully exploitative anymore and therefore new avenues were to be sought for exploitation. And this is where Lenin would argue imperialism comes in. The European economies, in order to continue to exploit the working classes, in order to generate adequate profit for sustaining the system of capitalism, they went on to export capital to other parts of the world and as more and more industrial societies began to be in competition over areas to exploit, over regions, over countries to exploit, the invariably these industrial societies began to become, uh, began to come on a collision course and that is where the roots of imperialism have to be sought. Although arguments made by both Hobson and Lenin bring out the basic economic impulse behind imperialism, the arguments have been subsequently modified by historians who look at much more the inner dynamics of the European societies that propelled Europe towards imperialism. There was a qualitative difference, historians point out, between what was the old form of colonialism and the phenomenon that we see in the 19th century. It is true that Europe had been establishing colonies all over the world from around the 16th century. The Spanish colonies in America, the Portuguese colonies in America and Africa as also Asia tended to be generally colonies in the proper sense of the term, which is where people would actually go from the metropolitan regions and settle down. These were basically colonies of settlement and the primary utility of these colonies of settlement tended to be in terms of plantation economy where manual labor could be deployed for generation of resources of a lower order. So the Spanish colonies in uh, America used to be uh, pivotal in the shaping of the plantation economies of, the, of Latin America from which we have things like cocoa and um, coffee. Similarly, the cotton plantations of the, of the 13 colonies of the United States of America or the 13 colonies of the New World uh, as also other plantations um, of molasses and sugarcane from Central America also the mines of Central America were pivotal to them to sort of bolster, to bolstering European economy during the 17th and 18th century. Simultaneously, if you will look at the, uh, the Dutch colonies of East Asia or British colonies and French settlements in South Asia, the general idea was to extract some resources from the colonies and then feed it into the main commercial network devised by the metropolitan regions of Europe. But nevertheless, if one leaves aside the British and the French settlements in Asia, then the colonies from the 16th to the 18th centuries in America and Africa involved actual physical settlement of colonies of people from the metropolitan region in the colony. These were the colonists. Now these 
technically historians have spoken of as the colonies of settlement. There were other areas such as uh, what the British were to devise in India or the French were to devise in Indochina or the Dutch were to do devise in Southeast Asia, which were primarily colonies of exploitation, where migration from the metropolitan regions was not important. What was important was extracting economic resources and then deploying it in the use of the uh, metropolitan region. The interesting thing is that in the 18th century, there was emerging a general consensus that such colonial exploitation was economically unremunerative. Because once Adam Smith published his Wealth of Nation in the 1770s, the standard economic orthodoxy began to move from the original position of the economic benefits of, econ of colonial exploitation to make the argument that competitive advantage in economic activity is the best. So if a particular area of the world is suitable for a particular type of production, then its economic activity has to be geared towards that end rather than the specific resource based need of the metropolitan country. It was largely in this uh, mode of thinking that um, Adam Smith's further argument that colonial economic exchanges actually slow down any economic transaction that takes place between the metropolitan and the colony. By the end of the 18th century, the general economic consensus was turning out to be that once a colonial attachment, once a colonial relationship is severed, it actually boosts economic exchange. This was particularly true as it was proven when the commercial exchange between Great Britain and the 13 colonies of the eastern seaboard of America, which was to later become the United States of America, they, the, the, the volume of actual commerce grew once America became independent. So by the second half, by the closing years of the uh, 18th century, colony was, as they would say, passe. It was no longer considered to be a good proposition. Bentham in the early 19th century encouraged and exhorted the French to dismantle their colonial empire. And by the second half of the 19th century, this orthodoxy was becoming so very firmly entrenched that the two polar opposites of British politics in the second half of the 19th century, Gladstone and Benjamin Disraeli, if they came to agree on only one single issue, it was that eventually the British Empire would also have to be dismantled. And this is the crucial thing, that as late as 1870s, there was an emergent orthodoxy, or let's say an entrenched orthodoxy, which was arguing that colonial empire was bad. Colonial uh, exploitation was unproductive, unremunerative in the long run for the metropolitan region. And then, as historians have pointed out, that in the 1870s, there was almost a 180 degree turn executed, definitely by the British Empire, but perhaps even before that by the French, as a new round of colonial expansionism began to be the order of the day. Even before 1870, one can argue, that the French had gone on to acquire new colonies in Africa, in Algeria and also in Asia, in Indochina, when capital was not always easily available for surplus, by way of surplus for export. So Hobson and Lenin's original assumption that the principal driving motive for colonial expansion was export of capital did not really hold water because French expansion in Algeria or in the China came at a time when French, even French industry was looking for capital everywhere and not always uh, was able to find it. Um, such an explanation would also fail to explain why the acquisition of Tunisia by Jules Ferry and Leo Gambetta in France uh, in the teeth of public op opposition could be executed. Neither can such explanation account 
for the preference of investment in Indian railways by British capital at a time when the actual investment potentials in Argentina say in South America in general uh, would have been considerably greater. It is not always that capital wa was dr dragging an empire in its wake. Sometimes empire would also direct the flow of capital. And what is the most important uh, re reservation that historians have expressed about this theory about exportable capital, surplus capital driving the, the drive, uh, the impetus for the empire was that if you look at the destination of German capital, which they were beginning to export from the 1870s, was never concentrated, was never heavily invested even in the German colonies of Africa or Asia. The greatest German involvement by way of capital investment happened to be in the Balkans, which was a member of the Austro-Hungarian Empire or in the Ottoman Empire, uh, in, the, in the Levant in Eastern Asia, uh, in Western Asia. The principal factor, historians argue, behind the dawn of this new age in imperialism has to be sought elsewhere. It was nevertheless economic in character, but of an entirely different order from that which had been suggested by historians like, uh, by uh, commentators like Hobson and um, Lenin. The argument is that continental Europe never really came around to experiencing anything even remotely similar to what was called the first generation of industrial revolution uh, that Britain had experienced around textile industry. If you look at the pattern of European industrialization, then the principal emphasis had always been on heavy industry. In the continent, it has always been on the heavy industry. It took off in the 1830s uh, around railway buildup and it reached its peak uh, in the 1840s and 50s. And this was in fact one of the prime movers, historians tell us, uh, in the direction of the emergence of the nation state. By 1870, however, the principal nation states with strong economic powerhouses were already in shape. Germany is the best example. And what happens is that once a nation state has come into being, it marks the limits of which economic integration could attain. Beyond the realm of the nation state, it was not possible for an economic uh, foundation resting on the principle of nationalism to carry the thing further. Therefore, by the 1870s, one could argue that the industrial economies of Europe were physically becoming saturated. I mean, once a nation state had come into being, one could exploit the market much more effectively, but it was very difficult for the market to expand phenomenally the manner in which it did, say, between 1830s and 1870s, when fragments were being pieced together to come into an integrated market. Once the integrated market has to come in place, one can explore deeper, but one cannot spread the uh, amount of exploitation that is possible, which is the reason why in the 1870s, Europe was confronted with one of the severest economic crises for several generations. And one of the principal manifestations of this was that the growth rate of all the major European industrial economies were beginning to slow down. It was slowing down so alarmingly that Europeans were actually suggesting, were, they were apprehending that Europe was sliding into a depression. While that fear was actually unfounded, Europe's reaction was based on the principle that they are sliding into depression and this would mean that the industry which had become so important player in Europe's economic life would now stop being that significant. It was largely out of this apprehension that towards the closing years of the 1870s, Europe began to move into an era of economic protectionism. This begins essentially with Germany in around 1878-79 when the German industry demanded high tariff barriers uh, so that 
German economic area could be sealed off to foreign competition. Support was being given also by the German agriculturist lobby who wanted to keep out a voluminous exports by Russia and America and Canada. And uh, protectionism becomes the order of the day in an industrial society which was uh, being hit very severely by uh, the stagnation. And what is curious about this period of course is that once protectionism begins to emerge in one country, others begin to follow suit. So from one state to a neighboring state, the march of economic protectionism proved very quick. And this is therefore the period when France, Germany, Belgium, Britain all began to look towards overseas markets to help uh, the beleaguered economy back home. Britain, in fact, came a little slower in this respect because it already had a uh, colonial economy, a large colonial empire to exploit. Those that had the least began to expand faster in this direction. There is this argument, therefore, that historians have come up with that confronted with a crisis, social, political or economic, of an essentially domestic nature, countries that resort to colonial exploitation or colonial expansion generally tend to be those which already have had an imperial past. So France in the 1840s and 50s, when it was faced with a domestic political and economic crisis, tried to sort of release steam, tried to release a bit of pressure by expanding overseas and generating activity in the French society by embarking on colonial expansion. Similarly, Russia was moving into the Caspian region and moving into the, um, the, the Caucasian region, not necessarily because it needed specific resources to tap for industrial uh, requirements or because it needed markets in which it could dump its industrial ware, but because of its strategic notion of what would secure Russia. So Russian expansion into Central Asia was dominated not so much by economic considerations when it started. It is true that when Russia embarked on the past path of industrialization, its domination of Central Asia became handy because it was then functioning as a market. But one has to bear in mind the fact that Central Asia, when Russia expanded into it, it was not so much to look for a market, but in order to look for in pursuit of what was known as the warm water policy, looking for ports which would not freeze up during the long Russian winter. Another set of major considerations that frequently need, uh, that frequently uh, get ignored is the fact that strategic and political imperatives frequently propel imperial expansion. The best case is Britain because British expansion in Asia and Africa had taken place earlier in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. In the 19th century, British expansion in Africa was driven principally by the need to keep France out of, uh, of large Swedes of Africa. The Cape to Cairo policy of uh, the British was meant to connect all the British territories from the Cape of Good Hope in the south of Africa to Cairo in the north by creating an undisturbed link of colonies without having any French areas jutting in between. Now there was no original, no such original intention that the British had in the early part of the 19th or even the middle of the 19th century. It was only when the French embarked on a policy from Dakar to Aden, which was from Senegal to the Ara Arabian Peninsula, France wanted to establish colonies across this region that Britain thought this would disturb the territorial contiguity or territorial congruence of the British Empire in Africa. And therefore, they pushed uh, into regions like the Sudan, which resulted in almost a conflict situation at Fashoda in 1898, to which we will turn subsequently. There was also this other point that there was a civilizing mission that the Europeans began to think in terms of. 
For them, Africa was the dark continent which needed to be explored. And as explorers like Mango Park, Stanley, Livingstone, and a number of others, as they began to explore the various parts of Africa, hitting the base of the Nile or the, the source of the Nile, the map of Africa began to become clear. And Europe began to uh, be of the opinion that the people in these regions, they were backward, they were smired in superstition, and they needed to be civilized. The civilizing mission drew a large number of people to come forth and support any, uh, a venture which not necessarily would have been economically uh, promising. But once the popular support was there, the idea of colonial expansion begins to be, uh, began to be much more acceptable. This is the reason why uh, Leon Gambetta, the French premier, had once observed that having a man like Cardinal Lavigeri propagating Christianity and propagating French values in Tunisia was as good as the presence of a whole French legion uh, in that land. So it was not simply the economic motives, but also the political motives and this idea of a civilizing mission that propelled imperialism forward. And this was how the phenomenon of imperialism began to play such a major role in the shaping of Africa. The race for empires which began in the second half of the 19th century had progressed at a breathtaking pace. In 1875, European colonies occupied only 10% of African territory. In 1895, merely 20 years later, only 10% of African territories actually remained free of European colonial presence. Between 1871 and 1900, the area of the British Empire expanded by a staggering 4.25 million square miles and population increased by 66 million. The territory of the French Empire increased 3.5 million square miles and population grew by 6.5 million. German Empire increased a million square miles and population grew by 13 million. For Italy, the same figures were 185,000 square miles and population of around 750,000. It was also this imperialism and the clash, the clashes that it generated that made the international relations of this period so turbulent, so full of um, conflicts that ultimately was to drag Europe in the direction of the Great War of 1940.